we're welcoming you today from the, the European Migration Network, of course, which is hosted uh, by the Economic and Social Research Institute. And it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome everybody to uh, today's event, uh, which is on immigration detention and alternatives, Ireland uh, and the EU. So uh, a lot of you, of course, will have participated uh, in EMN Ireland events uh, before. So as you know, uh, EMN represents this um, sort of you know, trans-European network uh, under the auspices of the European Commission, uh, where all the national contact points work uh, very, very well to generate sort of comparable information on aspects uh, of sort of asylum and migration across Europe. Uh, and it's always a great uh, pleasure to, uh, for, the, for the Institute. Um, obviously, the, the, the colleagues work, work with us are part of the Institute, and we host this uh, on behalf of the Department of Justice and the European Commission. Uh, within the Institute. Um, so for many years now, uh, we've been running events like this, uh, where on the one hand, we get to hear the sort of the, the, the Irish dimension of the particular issues that are under discussion, uh, but then we also hear uh, the, the, the broader European perspective. And in today's uh, webinar, uh, we're going to sort of carry on uh, with that tradition, and I'll introduce you to the various speakers in a couple of, of moments. Um, but I think again, you know, people who log into ESRI seminars on a on webinars on a regular basis and also the EMN ones, you'll understand that we're also always eager to sort of add a, a, a policy and a sort of a practitioner strand uh, to these sort of discussions and uh, delighted to say uh, that later on we'll have again folks in the Department of Justice and uh, from an, an NGO as well who will talk about the various issues uh, that are under discussion. And hopefully, I'm sure we will have a, a little bit of time. We're going to plan this to go to about 3.30. Uh, we should have some time for questions and answers uh, later on as well. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, we'll be using the Q&A function. Uh, so at any point during the event, if you want to start submitting questions, I'll do my best to try and moderate a Q&A uh, later on in the afternoon. Uh, so I think the plan is we'll probably just go straight through uh, with all the presentations and then for some discussion uh, at the end. So I, I, I don't have to convince anybody who's logged on. This is obviously an enormously important uh, topic, both within Ireland uh, and internationally. Uh, so I think it's it's a very important discussion, a very timely discussion that we're having today. And uh, I have to say, I am very much looking forward to it. So with that, uh, I did say at the, at the outset that we were going to begin with the uh, the sort of the international uh, perspective, the European-wide uh, perspective. And in that context, it's a, a pleasure to introduce Sarah Bagnato. So Sarah works with the uh, essentially the, the service provider to the EMN network as a consultancy firm called ICF. And for many years, uh, ICF have worked with the European Migration uh, Network and done a pretty heroic job, uh, which is to take the sort of, you know, the 24, 25 studies, whatever like that, across Europe and to produce a, a synthesis where you get a sort of a general flavor uh, of the type of policies that are in existence uh, across uh, the European Union, of course, some countries uh, beyond the European Union. So it's always a very heroic uh, job to do. Uh, but over the years, we've, we've had uh, fantastic people who've done this and have then come to events like this and given these really, really wonderful uh, presentations. So that's probably putting a little bit of pressure on you, Sarah, but I've no uh, doubt that you're going to live up to the challenge uh, of, of doing what your colleagues have been doing uh, uh, over the years. So with that, let me hand over to you. I know you've got some uh, slides to share and uh, you've got about 20 minutes or so. And uh, if, if, if you're sort of coming close or whatever like that, I might just give you a nod because we've been busy afternoon. I just want to make sure we keep uh, everything moving. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much for the very lovely introduction. And yeah, thank you for setting up, up the bar. And evidently, I count on you in case of stopping me if like times, I know times easily flies by. Um, maybe if I, if you can just all confirm that you correctly hear me and see my slides. Yeah, can, can see you and hear the slide. See, Everything is good, Sarah. I see your head in nodding. That's great. Um, yeah, well, so like, thank you a lot. And uh, I must say that actually I myself looking really forward to hearing the presentation and the discussions today. And I hope that my intervention can really help uh, setting up a little bit the overall and broader context. Uh, what I'm going to present, in fact, is the outline and very preliminary findings of what is actually an upcoming uh, Yemen study on detention and alternatives. The Yemen studies, you nicely really like explained, uh, are actually comparative overview based on national contribution of what the Yemen, the Yemen Ireland report is one of those. 
Um, so what I just that, that there is no surprise. Um, what I will uh, guide you through today is really like reminding a bit what is the rationale and aims of the studies, um, and then giving very briefly an overview of the UAKI relevant to detention immigration. Again, mostly aiming like to set a bit the floor for the discussion and definitely for what is the background for, for, for this study. Um, and then I will go walk you through the four main thematic uh, areas, I'd say, of focus that were covered by the study. I will avoid reading out now the titles that you see in, in the slide as I really like going through that like uh, in the presentation. Uh, sort of, well, I thought I was wondering how to shortly and like walking through and explaining the rationale for the study. I think, Alan, you already said probably there is not much to say on, about the importance of, uh, of this topic. Uh, but then I thought that actually what might be interesting then really to remind and setting a bit the floor is giving some definitions. Those that, you, um, that we use and that the study use are taken from the MN glossary. Uh, which I, many of you probably know already um, what is about. And the definition we find there of detention is like a non-punitive administrative measure, whether it is ordered by administrative or judicial authority. Uh, this is done uh, to restrict the liberty of a person to allow for other provision, other procedures, notably what considering the studies like return and international protection procedures. So to allow those to happen and be implemented. Um, consequently, like or linked to that, uh, the alternatives to detention, and again, I stress, we are talking about detention, alternative detention in the context of migration, are the four measures that um, are taken when grounds for detention exist, and therefore, or when grounds for migration detention existed. So like where this is needed like to uh, implement other procedures, but in nature are not custodial measures. And to give like, the, to complete the picture for explaining the rationale, well, I really don't want to like to give a, le a legal lecture, but just to set again, like the, the, as a reminder, as any other form of arrest and detention, also migration detention needs of to do fully uh, be in line with fundamental rights, notably like the, the, the right to liberty and security, which prohibits any arbitrary arrest or detention. And in that context, the principles of legality, proportion necessity and proportionality are a paramount and of any decision um, taken by national authorities to issue a return, a, um, a detention order for a third country national. I, I think it's really uh, important for it to, to recall the wide um, uh, jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court and really widely also reflected in EU law that detention is a measure of last resort and uh, alternatives to detention uh, and actually detention is only lawful where if authorities can demonstrate and prove that there is not any less coercive alternatives that can be used for the same purpose. And well, against this legal background, um, fact is that uh, many reports indicate actually that implementation alternatives to detention lags behind in terms of uh, really uh, finding effect, like alternatives that are being uh, considered as effective and used uh, regularly. <clears throat> and like the same conclusions were reached also in the context of, all of the MN collaboration with the Council of Europe. Um, that uh, in a in occasion of a conference at this point, held almost two years ago, a uh, called for actually having collecting more information about availability and use of uh, alternatives to detention, and also like called for collecting more empirical evidence on the effectiveness of alternatives to detention. Um, and so the immense study really aims to chip in, how to say, or to contribute to fill this knowledge gap. Of course, it's not uh, within the scope and the capacities of the research of the MN, uh, like the contribution that he would study so to, to give is really mapping out and assess uh, the availability of you and use or practical organization of alternatives to detention. 
the procedures and criteria used uh, to assess whether a third country national is placed um, is, up, is placed in detention or has seen applied an alternative, and also assess the availability of information useful to assess uh, the impact of detention uh, and compare it to the impact of alternatives to detention in terms of um, supporting or improving the effectiveness of migration procedures. This term effectiveness of migration procedures, I think, can an entire discussion could focus on that. Uh, you see in the slide like uh, three aspects that are considered of it. I will dive in uh, into these three points a bit later on in my presentation and spare repetition in this at this stage. Before <clears throat> entering like into the um, the, um, the uh, on the specific areas and topics covered in the study, uh, it would be helpful like to just very briefly recall what is the UA key that is a basic, essentially the framework uh, for, for this study. Um, in the international protection, grounds for detention are set uh, in the reception condition directive and in the Dublin regulation. Essentially, those uh, concern uh, allowing for uh, the, the determination of the identity of a third country national or like collecting information required and, or useful to process their asylum application, but also to avoid abuses of asylum procedures when a third country national is already within a return, a return procedure. And specifically in the context of uh, Dublin transfers, uh, detention is seen as a mean to avoid absconding where a significant risk is, exists. The <clears throat> reception condition directive, as well as the asylum procedure directive, set out as a number of guarantees. I would like uh, to stress here, especially the fact that it insists that the detention is a last resort alternative and, and only applied if, uh, after the possibility to apply less coercive measures is taken into account. In the area of return procedure, uh, like this reception is also foreseen as a possibility uh, to, in order to prepare the return or to carry out the return process, again, when a risk for absconding exists, or where the third country national concerned avoids or hampers the return. <clears throat> um, a development that might be interesting to just um, uh, followed up or to, 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 to see what uh, the, the future developments is like uh, potentially the approval of the proposal for, a, for what is now a proposal of the Recaster Return Directive that sets out actually criteria for uh, assessing the risk of, of, of absconding. And the criteria in that sense that at least standing as to the letter of the, the current proposal include, for instance, lack of documentation, um, lack of, uh, of identity documents, forgery of the identity documents or their destruction, but also non-compliance with the return decision or failure to comply with obligations to cooperate. I will go back to that, but I, it is interesting that this proposal of the Commission is actually in large part based on what is already available in a, legal, in a national legal frameworks or practice. Uh, Again, what I would stress then in terms of guarantees that are also set out in the return directive is two aspects. One, just to stress again, detention also return procedures is a mean of uh, last resort. Second is that uh, the actual return directive does not, does not give examples of what can be used as alternatives to detention. However, it does list a number of practices um, that could be, uh, or measures that could be applied in when like a, a period for voluntary return is given to avoid the risk of, of, of absconding. And those measures include actually type of measures that are typically used as alternatives in, in other contexts, like, fin like financial guarantees, uh, submission of documents, or obligation to stay in a specific place. However, and again, this might be actually a, a topic for further discussion, but uh, strict to census, those are not alternatives uh, in that context, because actually our measures in the context of a period for voluntary return, those measures are adopted without uh, ground for detention to exist. So are not necessarily based on 
an individual assessment of the existence of, of dams for detention. Um, I insist on this point because I will come back on that. Um, there may, might be a number of practices that actually for now are used in this context, but actually are currently being explored as, as being fully fledged, let's say, uh, alternative to detention in, in proper sense. So on this overview, I would like then to really dive in in what a bit is more uh, the, 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 the substance of the report. Uh, I'm afraid that I am really just I'm afraid that I will actually try to leave the level of spoiling really to the bare minimum. Uh, this study is not finalized yet. Um, it is scheduled to be published in December or at the latest in January 2022. So I just really welcome everyone to invite everyone to stay tuned. Uh, what I want to present is mostly like uh, really the, what the study covers, what is the information that is going to be there, and some very large you know, preliminary facts that emerge. So one of the, uh, the, first, the first area that the study looked at um, is the changes in national legal policy framework um, done since 2015. The date corresponded to the, to the date of when the last event studies on this subject uh, was published. So in the sense, the idea was try to have like a continuity and see what was different. Uh, what we saw is that changes like um, concrete examples, the study will give concrete examples uh, and more detailed really the changes happening at national levels and a lot of details. Um, but in, in, the, in, the, in the main changes really like so to clarify scope or definition and criteria uh, to use detention and especially like to clarify the criteria to assess the risk of, of, of absconding. But some changes also happened to adjust the time of detention. May, in many, in several instances, to extend uh, this, the period of allowed detention. Uh, other changes mostly sought to provide uh, better safeguards to vulnerable groups, along with also making more you know, alternatives available and uh, yeah, seeking to increase their use. And actually, this clearly opened up like, to what is probably like the, the core of the study is like making a mapping on the type of alternatives that are available across member states. Um, for what, what, what emerged is, a, I would say, like, so of course, a number of, of measures are used as, a, as, a, as alternative. And what we could see is that there is like main three main clusters of um, a group of, a, of, of measures that are both widely available in law and also used in practice, essentially because they're easy to use, fairly effective and, um, and, and suitable to the specific, to the usual typical circumstances of third country national. There is like then a second group of practice of measures that are uh, yes widely, widely available in law but not that much uh, used in practice. And then there is a few uh, alternatives that are had been applied in some countries uh, and again so it's not really widely common but could be considered in a way new and possibly more some actually not any longer that new uh, but that could possibly be explored uh, more. In the first category, we found notably reporting obligations, requirements to reside to a designated place, and surrender passport. Um, I believe that like, those are self sufficiently self-explanatory in terms of what is in nature. I would like just to write that for what concerns requirement to reside to a designated space, um, we saw that this includes both uh, residents to an individual um, accommodation, but also to facilities. And unsurprisingly, often like a challenge is that exactly there is lack of such facilities or that country national do not have a specific residence, making the, the application actually of, the, of, this, of this type of measure difficulty, difficult. On the other hand, like a common uh, advantages that was like highlighted for both, for the three of this type of, uh, for the three of these um, of this type of uh, measures, is that they are considerably less costly than, than detention. Um, worth noting also that su su surrender passport and reporting obligation are often coupled with other alternatives to detention. 
In the second uh, group, uh, we found uh, the obligation to communicate uh, an address, the release on bail and financial guarantees. Again, say this is a, often in law, those are listed as measures that are possible. Their implementation seems to really like being hampered by, by their really applicability to the situation of third country nationals in most of the cases. I mentioned often the people in this, in this situation do not have an address. Um, so hard like to, 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 to work on that basis in terms of controlling the movements. Release on base and financial guarantees really pose problems in terms of assessing the financial capacities, often the lack of actually lack financial capacities, capacities of, this, of, the, of the person in questions. Plus actually managing sureties proved to be fairly challenging. Um, in terms of other alternatives, uh, which I believe actually have been looked in several uh, fora with quite a lot of an attention, uh, we found community management programs. Um, essentially, it is as about assigning a case manager to, uh, to each third country national, whether it is like in asylum procedure or in a return procedure, and working out with the person like through all the process as a way to really establish that trust and the trust uh, relationship. Um, in many ways linked to, to that, of course, there is various forms of return counseling that have been used that, that have been used in alternative in, uh, as alternatives to detention. I would like just to stress though that in that for what we could see, actually only one member state formally so adopted like as, as a formal alternative to detention return, for, uh, return counseling, intended as compulsory counseling session instead of detention, so based on the ground on a decision for detention. Otherwise, both return counseling community management program are those that lie a bit like in between you know, type of measures that are used in body context and that some member states have been trying to use more and more as a formal alternative to detention. Um, in this same group also like there is at, at least two member states have been trying to test like the possibility to use uh, accommodation in asylum, compulsory accommodation in asylum facilities instead of detention. Um, at this point, I actually have like prepared some slides with a bit more information of each uh, of each of these practices, but which I propose on skipping through, and I'm very much happy to go back to those in case there is any questions uh, from the participants or their panelists. Um, also, for the sake of for the sake of interesting interest of time. Then the third uh, thematic area covered by the study. Um, is about looking at the assessment procedures and criteria used uh, to assess whether the application of an alternative to detention is feasible instead of designing for detention. Um, again, unsur unsurprisingly and in line with the regulation, we found that across all member states, like these assessments, so the, alter the use of alternatives to, to uh, alternatives to detention is considered uh, considered simultaneously uh, to the to the assessment of the existence of grounds for detention and to make a decision of uh, on detention. What are the grounds for detention then? Like uh, across national uh, national legislations, uh, I think uh, it is really much a reflection on what is in EU law. Uh, as a main grounds really is the risk of uh, preventing the risk of absconding. Uh, this is mainly in the context of return, establishing the identity, and this mostly in the, in the context of international protection. Uh, but also grounds for detention could be like non-compliance with alternatives, uh, or whether the individual presents destroyed or forged documents. But also like if there is like a, they, they ask, if they are assessed to, uh, to to constitute a threat to national security public order, or if there is reasonable grounds to believe that the person might commit an offense. Um, when, ad then as when addressing those grounds and linking it then to a decision as to whether it is most suitable to apply detention or alternative, the criteria used therefore is actually the level of the risk of abstaining. Again, here is not surprisingly. And as I mentioned, like what emerged here, what is confirmed that uh, like a lot of the proposals that came through then uh, the proposal for the return recast directive 
found like uh, a ground on the on the provision present already in, uh, in a, 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 a national level uh, includes as uh, in fact some of the or the specific criteria used to, to assess the risk of absconding include use of false documents lack of cooperation etc vulnerability is in all member states a main criteria assessed to make uh, to take this decision uh, and in particular to assess the specific needs that needs to be taken to, in, in, into account and in whatever the decision, whether it is eventually to place the person in detention or in alternatives, making sure that actually these special needs are taken into account and that the alternative, uh, it also when an alternative is, 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 uh, is decided upon, like making sure that this is suitable to the specific vulnerabilities of the person, but also to the specificities of the individual case. I mentioned before the example the case might not have like a, a, a fixed uh, residence, a fixed address. Clearly, uh, the uh, adopting as a as a as a as, the, um, as an alternative an obligation to stay in a in a given place might not be the most suitable option. Other criteria used uh, include uh, we, we include really like assessing or comparing. Uh, what is the less coercive measures that can reach the same, the same, uh, the same objectives? Which is this is really very much linked, basically, to the principle and implementation of the of the principle of proportionality. Um, in fewer member states, it appears that also like nationality or country of origin are taken into account uh, in this sense, uh, especially in the return procedures, uh, to take into account whether uh, the return can be considered as safe. And then, then finally, actually, only a handful of, uh, of member states reported on using cost effectiveness as a criteria. So really making, uh, try to, to make this, uh, this assessment and factoring in, in the decision. Um, finally, the like probably the, the bravest uh, last focus or thematic focus of the study, it was trying to assess the availability of information useful to assess the impact of uh, the to compare actually the impact of detention and impact of alternatives and of different alternatives on the effectiveness of, uh, of return and international protection procedures. I promised earlier to explain a little bit more what we intended uh, here with effectiveness. And we really referred back to what is, was the, frame, is the framework also adopted by the Council of Europe, uh, referring to effectiveness as mainly three key criteria, uh, notably ensuring compliance with migration procedures, upholding fundamental rights, uh, and improve the cost effectiveness of the migration management. Concerning like the uh, what what the study found, uh, like considering the availability of uh, useful information to assess the first uh, the first uh, criteria, um, yet what the study is like uh, attempt at least to do is to collect and present actually flows data about cases in detention and in and each individual different alternatives specifically related to reduce absconding, uh, facilitate prompt and fair case resolution, and encourage voluntary or and voluntary return or facilitated forced return. However, the, the, limit, the, data, the data that was able, that we could collect, or what actually the study main found is that there is very limited statistics on that, uh, simply they're not collected in a way that can be helpful to, uh, to make statistical assessment in that, uh, in that sense. Um, and also there is very li limited qualitative information actually help, help, helpful to create any direct causation between like the user alternatives or the user detention and a certain outcome. So absconding or not absconding or this, a decision to take up voluntary return, for instance. Um, Concerning the second criteria, so upholding fundamental rights, uh, again, the study will give actually a number of very concrete examples and will really dive in on what are the measures in place. Um, in the main, um, like it appears that uh, uh, legal safeguards are really present. Like, actually, the, the study like try to assess these by looking like at safeguards in and measures in place, looking at uh, upholding like legal aid, uh, right to be heard, right to health care. 
uh, really like it seems that very similar level of safeguards are, are at least provided by law and practice in both uh, alternatives and detention by national authorities. With, in some instances, some services uh, being only provided by national authorities only in detention, like, for instance, legal assistance or social and psychological counseling. Yet, this information is to be taken with the caveat that, in an alternative, uh, the person has a, a, available a number of services may be um, at disposal, for instance, by NGOs or uh, other organizations which might not equally be accessible in detention. Generally, here, here as well, it seems that for official evaluation done by member states is overall lacking. Uh, what is, however, widely available is a number of independent reports done by, by a researcher, independent, independent researchers or NGOs. Um, pointing it out, actually, a number of shortcomings in um, in the, in, uh, in the capacities to effectively protect the rights in detention, uh, and also on the impact of detention on the well-being of the person. And then finally, uh, looking at the third criteria of probably one of the, I think it, this is very interesting, I think the issue of cost effectiveness is widely debated and in a, uh, in a, from different perspectives, However, overall, um, it appears there is no really any official or independent evaluation was done to make really an assessment of the different cost effectiveness of detention compared to cost effect to, to alternatives and to try to compare those. Uh, only very, very, the very few uh, existing allow for really cautions, general findings, and like, in a sense, also somehow obvious in the sense that alternatives appear less effective to than detention to prevent absconding. Clearly, absconding from a detention center presents quite some quite obvious problem difficulties. Um, and there seems to be some evidence that alternatives, <coughs> that not all alternatives are really, sorry. <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> so, <coughs> so, pardon. Oh. <laughs> so it, it appears that not all alternatives are necessary. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. That not all alternatives are necessarily less costly than, than detention. <coughs> A point to highlight here, though, is that I for what we could see from the very few available reports is that the human costs of detention are not necessarily as yet taken into account in the evaluation. So often cost is really strictly dependent as financial cost for maintaining detention facilities, staff, etc. And I think my voice here has really tied me out. <laughs> so I actually close here and I remain very much available to respond to questions and give clarification. Apologies for my, <laughs> yeah. No Thank problem. No you, problem. Well. Sir, it was a really, really good presentation. So I'm glad your voice lasted until your very last slide. It would have been heartbreaking uh, if your voice had done earlier. Uh, really appreciated that. And actually, I have to say, uh, as an economist, um, the reflections on sort of cost effectiveness, um, very, very interesting as to how you would actually get a handle on that, how you might measure it. But I, uh, I think it was good you also uh, made reference to the fact that some of the studies don't capture the human cost uh, in this situation. And uh, anyway, lot, lots to think about. But you really set things up very, very well for us, and uh, we very much uh, appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to turn next to uh, my colleague, uh, Emily Kniff. And Emily is going to take you through the details of the report on Ireland. And um, the, the report is now available on the ESRI website. Uh, so uh, I know you'll, you'll all listen and, and engage uh, with Emily's presentation, uh, but you will have the opportunity uh, to, to read in greater uh, detail in a few moments. So with that, Emily, over to you. I think you're going to share some slides as well. And uh, you have your glass of water beside you, I hope. I do indeed. Thank you, Alan. I'll just share my slides here. <clears throat> 
Okay. Yeah, perfect. We can see them. Perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you, Alan, and thank you, Sarah, for that overview of the EMN study. I'm looking forward to its publication hopefully soon. Um, so I'll report on the Irish national study. So this was initially submitted for that EMN report, uh, and then we developed it into a national study. Um, so in my presentation today, I'll give a few of the main findings. I'll first uh, give an overview of the relevant Irish legislation. This is very much an overview, uh, so I would encourage you to look to the report. Um, and we look at four different categories of legal status or legal situation um, in the state. And then I'll follow this up by an overview of the use of detention in practice in Ireland, and then similarly the use of alternatives to detention in practice. And then I'll go through some of the key conclusions, uh, but again, I would encourage you to, to have a look at our report. So in terms of the legislation that applies, the first two categories of people that we looked at uh, were people who are international protection applicants in the state and people who are subject to a Dublin transfer decision. So for people who are international protection applicants, the main piece of legislation here is the International Protection Act. So section 20 of that act contains provisions as regards detention. So if an international protection applicant, so the grounds for detention there are in order to, so where the international protection applicant hasn't made reasonable efforts to establish their identity, where the applicant presents a, public, a threat to public order, public security in the state, among other grounds. Um, so an applicant who uh, is suspected of, um, or is, detained on one of these grounds is first brought before a district court judge and that judge has to assess whether those grounds apply and whether either detention can be used or an alternative to detention can be applied. Uh, for international protection applicants, the detention period is of 21 days. Um, but then in terms of the alternatives that exist, uh, the judge can require an applicant to reside in a specific place in the state, uh, to report at regular interviews uh, intervals, uh, and to surrender if they have had them any passport or travel documents. In practice, however, this has actually only been used in one instance since the coming into force of the International Protection Act at the end of 2016. Um, and then secondly, people who are subject to Dublin transfer decisions. So Sarah talked a little bit about this, but the Dublin system is one in which, uh, which assigns responsibility for international protection applications. So when somebody applies for asylum, say in Ireland, and it's found that actually the responsibility for that application lies with another member state, they're issued with what is called a Dublin transfer decision. And then they're in Ireland awaiting that transfer. Um, and the Dublin 3 regulation, which is an EU regulation, applies here. Um, and then there's supplementary legislation in Ireland, so the European Union Dublin system regulations. So firstly, um, most people who have Dublin uh, transfer decisions tend to have to comply with alternatives to detention. So they're required to uh, report regularly to a guard station, for instance, to cooperate with authorities in facilitating their transfer, among other uh, conditions. They can also be detained. Uh, that's under Article 28 of the Dublin 3 regulation, which again is transposed or supplemented in national law. Um, but where they present a significant risk of absconding. And an important case here is Al Chador, which is a court of justice of the EU case, of the EU, um, which stated that all member states need to have in their national legislation objective criteria to assess what a significant risk of absconding is. So in Ireland, that is set out in those regulations in 2000, of 2018. Um, so that's the first two categories. And relevant for these first two categories are uh, detention conditions. Um, they're relevant for all, but there's legislation there for um, international protection applicants and persons subject to Dublin transfers. Um, as many of you may recall, in 2017, there was a Supreme Court case, NHV, concerning access to the labour market for international protection applicants. Um, and following that, there was a decision to opt into the recast reception conditions directive. Um, and not only did that bring in provisions for access to the labour market, but it also brought in a number of standards as regards detention uh, of international protection applicants and um, also persons in the Dublin system. Um, and those can be found under Regulation 19. So that's the transposition of um, that directive in national law. And therein you can see a number of the conditions that are set out. And there also are some amendments there to the International Protection Act of 2015. Um, 
And then the third and fourth category, and I will go over this quite quickly, but um, are people who have received uh, deportation orders. Uh, so the relevant piece of legislation here is the Immigration Act of 1999. Um, so when a person is issued with a deportation order, the first requirement is that they leave the state. And um, uh, failing this, they are often required to comply with a number of conditions. And they can include uh, the requirement to report to a Garda station or often to Bird Key in Dublin. Um, the requirement to uh, cooperate with authorities uh, in facilitating their removal from the state, the requirement um, to provide authorities information about their address and any change of address. And those are all set out under section 39A I uh, one through six there. And then in terms of detention, um, so again, when somebody is issued with a deportation order, they're not automatically detained and it is used, uh, it's not commonly used uh, whatsoever. But under section five, there are provisions uh, for detention. Um, it's permitted for an aggregate of three, eight weeks. Um, and this period is renewable, but that renewal has to be uh, sanctioned by a judge. Um, and most places in the state, so most prisons in the state can be used for detention, but in the main um, Clover Hill prison is used. And then in terms of case law, so somebody who has a deportation order, they can only be detained where there is a concluded attention to deport somebody and their removal is feasible within that eight week period. Um, I've put some of the case law here. There is quite a significant amount of case law and that's all set out within the report. Um, but in the report, I try to go through how this case law has also affected uh, legislation. And then the last category of people that we look at in this report are people who've been refused leave to land. So that means people who have been refused permission to enter the state at the frontiers of the state. And this is typically at a port of entry. And the two acts that are relevant here are the Immigration Acts of 2003 and 2004. Um, the grounds for refusal are set out in section 4.3. So when somebody presents to um, immigration authorities, they can be refused leave to land and it can be for, for one of those reasons listed therein, such as the failure to have a valid passport or the failure to have a valid visa, among other grounds. Um, following a refusal, so what typically happens is that somebody would be refused leave to land, and I know Kevin from the Border Management Unit will talk a bit more about this uh, later, but when somebody is refused leave to land, uh, there is an intention to return them on the next available flight. Um, then there's also the consideration of an alternative to detention. So people can be issued with, with what is known as a section 14.1 notice. Um, so they can be permitted to enter the state for a number of days and then they have to return to um, the airport to uh, get on that return flight and their passport is surrendered. Um, they can also be detained. So under section five, they can be detained in the port or in a vehicle for up to 12 hours. Uh, and then they can also be detained in a place of detention for up to eight weeks. And again, Clover Hill Prison tends to be the main prison used, um, but other prisons in the state can be used if needed. So that's all the legislation. Um, and what you can see is really that the extent to which detention alternatives exist and the extent to which they are used depends on the category uh, and the legal situation of the person. So for international protection applicants, detention has only been used in, in one case since the coming into force of that act. And then alternatives to detention tend to be used more frequently for people with deportation orders and Dublin transfer decisions. Um, in Ireland, there's no dedicated immigration detention facility. Um, a lot of EU countries do have dedicated immigration detention facilities, Ireland does not. So in the main prisons are used, as well as guard stations, uh, ports and detention can also occur in vehicles. Um, the main prison used for uh, men is Clover Hill Prison, which is a remand prison. Uh, and for women, it tends to be the Docus Centre in the Mountjoy Prison Campus. Um, international protection applicants who are women cannot be detained in a prison, according to the legislation. The only um, applicable place of detention would be a guard station. Um, so those are, yes, the main places of detention. Uh, in terms of oversight of these places of detention, on an international level, um, we have the Council of Europe, the CPT, and it's perhaps the best known uh, in the Irish context. Um, but the CPT conducted its most recent visit to Ireland, uh, well, it published its report at the end of last year. 
it doesn't visit Ireland very frequently, it's approximately every four years. Um, but in that it's described that block F of Clover Hill Prison has been converted for use for uh, immigration detention. Um, it is not currently in use due to COVID-19 uh, requirements for cocooning and isolating of prisoners, um, but there is an intention to use it as an interim solution. Uh, in the government's response to that CPT report, it does state that there is exploration of a more long-term um, solution. And then there's also uh, concerns raised in these CPT reports uh, as regards the use of prisons. So they state both in this report and in their previous reports that prisons are not suitable facilities uh, for immigration detention uh, because the people who are being detained, which is an administrative form of detention, uh, have not been suspected or uh, charged with a criminal offence. Um, the other international body is the UN uh, Committee Against Torture. So they publish some observations on Ireland. Again, it's not very frequent, but in those they have quite similar concerns as those raised by the CPT. Uh, they also encourage Ireland to ratify the OPCAT, uh, which is the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture. So Ireland signed this back in 2007, I believe, uh, but has not ratified it. Um, and that would entail the establishment of what is known as a national preventive mechanism. So uh, a review body, an oversight, independent oversight body of all places of uh, where people are deprived of their liberty in the state. Um, and then very quickly, in terms of the national bodies, uh, for prisons specifically, there is the Office of the Inspector of Prisons. Uh, there are also visiting committees appointed by the Minister for Justice. Um, not all the reports of the Office of the Inspector of Prisons are, are available. Um, and also immigration detainees don't tend to feature very, very much in these reports. Um, so sometimes in the visiting committee reports on Clover Hill, you will see mention of uh, immigration detainees, mainly with regard to the disruption. Um, but there's not much of a coverage in terms of immigration detention in these reports. Okay, so here you see a graph of um, the number of persons who have been committed to prison for immigration issues uh, in Ireland. And these are figures from the Irish Prison Service Annual Reports. Um, so you see in 2014, 390 people were detained um, for immigration related issues. This decreased in 2015 and then gradually increased through to 2019. To 477 and decreased again uh, to 245 in 2020. Um, most of these committals for, for prison, most of the people who are committed, are, tend to be committed for quite short periods of time, um, so typically for a number of days. Uh, it's also important to note that this is not a comprehensive picture of uh, the extent to which detention is used in Ireland, so we don't have figures on detention in Garda stations or detention in ports, which is shorter, but we don't have those figures. And here we have figures on uh, that we obtained from the Irish Prison Service on the main reasons for which people are held in the prison. And these are reasons for committal, so people can be uh, committed more than once or on more than ground. Um, but the top two reasons you can see there are failure to hold a valid passport and failure to hold a valid visa, and they are um, significantly higher than the other reasons for committal. Again, the full list of, of reasons is set out in the report, so I would encourage you to have a look at that. And here um, is a graph of the refusals of leave to land between 2014 and 2020. So what you see between 2014 and 2019 is, is quite a significant increase in people refuse leave to land, um, and then a decrease in 2020, likely due to the reduction in international travel. Um, what you can see the main increase tends to be at air borders. This is from Eurostat, so that's uh, airports in the state. And then I'm gonna go through this quite quickly. Um, but in 2020, you had 2,221 persons who were refused leave to land at Dublin airport. Um, the top reason for which people were refused leave to land, so that's refused permission to enter the state, um, was that there was reason to believe that they were uh, they intended to enter the state for purposes other than those expressed. So that's section 43K of the Immigration Act of 2004. Um, it's important also to state that this ground can be used uh, in combination with a number of other grounds. So the ground was used 1,440 times. And then the second most common reason, reason was section 43G, that the non-national didn't have a valid passport or equivalent document. 
and then section 43E that the non-national uh, did not have a valid Irish visa. Again, these are set out in full in our report. Um, in terms of the nationalities of persons refused leave to land, these are figures from 2020 and these are the top 10 nationalities uh, refused leave to land. So the highest number um, of people refused leave to land came from Brazil. This was followed by Eritrea, South Africa, Syria, the US, Albania, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan. Um, so yes, those are for 2020. Um, but it's also important to note that 807 persons who were refused leave to land at Dublin Airport subsequently sought uh, international protection. So they were first refused and then would conduct a preliminary interview, typically with GNIB. Um, it was reported to us that not all persons who apply for international protection at uh, the airport would necessarily then present to the IPO uh, to continue with their international protection application. Um, in terms of the use of alternatives to detention, um, so we looked at these um, in the Irish legislation. They are non-custodial measures. They're quite similar to those of the criminal framework. Uh, and they exist across immigration and international protection legislation. So they include reporting requirements, the surrender of a passport or travel documents, a requirement to reside in a specified place, and a number of other requirements. And they can vary depending on the immigration uh, situation of the person. What we see is that they're used routinely for people with deportation orders and Dublin transfer decisions. Um, they're used in a minority of cases of persons uh, who are refused leave to land where detention is being considered. Uh, we conducted a number of interviews for this study with uh, civil society stakeholders and also with government stakeholders. Uh, and we talked about the advantages and the challenges uh, presented by alternatives to detention. And among the advantages reported uh, were that in using alternatives to detention instead of detention, it allows for greater personal liberty and the possibility of integration. Um, they are, of course, less invasive than detention, and um, from a state perspective, they entail lower costs and staffing requirements as compared to uh, using detention. And then in terms of the challenges, um, there's quite a high level of absconding with people who have alternatives to detention. Um, in the context of refusals of leave to land, there can be difficulties in establishing the identity of a person. Um, and then thirdly, uh, there are challenges faced by third country nationals themselves. So the cost of transport to reporting obligations. So for instance, to Berkey in Dublin or, and also the temporal uncertainty. So these were reported by NGOs uh, who stated that people can feel a certain temporal uncertainty around when a deportation order, for instance, will be enforced. And here are some of the key conclusions from the report. Um, I'll put them all out here. So, the provisions for and the use of detention and alternatives vary depending on the immigration status of the person in the state and their situation. Um, alternatives to detention are used routinely in deportation order cases and in Dublin transfer cases. And in the EMN study, what we can tell so far, but it's not a, a finalized study, but Ireland is among the EU member states to have alternatives in legislation and also then to use them routinely uh, in practice. Um, we also state, however, that we do need more data on uh, the use of detention in ports and in guard stations. Um, what we have right now is just prisons, but it's, it's difficult to paint, a, paint a, a comprehensive picture there. And then lastly, there is a chapter in the report on fundamental rights and access to safeguards. Um, and we do talk about them quite in depth there, but I will not cover that here because it will be covered uh, by Fiona Finn shortly. So that's all. The report is now available on emn.ie and also on the ESRI website. So um, I encourage you to take a look. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Emily. Huge amount of material uh, there, a lot of detail. Um, I'm hoping, people, I'm sure people will be reflecting on it. And I'm going to encourage people uh, to add questions through the, the Q&A function. Um, but we're, we're going to keep moving. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, time can get tight. Uh, so next contributor is Kevin Mattelier, uh, who's with the Border Management Unit in the Department of Justice. And as I said earlier, the, the ESRI uh, sort of runs EMN partly on behalf of the Department of Justice and the Commission, uh, but it's very much a partnership uh, organisation. So uh, we sort of rely on an awful lot of information being provided by the department 
and um, you know access to networks and everything like that. So it, it's always a great uh, pleasure to welcome um, the, the, the folks from the department uh, when they come along to these events. And of course, it's always very, very interesting to hear from them. So uh, Kevin, I'm going to hand over to you uh, at this stage. And just, I, I know you've got 15 minutes on the program, but if you could do it in 10, uh, it just means we might have a, a little bit more time for, for questions. So I don't mean to put sort of put yeah. you under pressure or anything like that, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you. No problem at all. Thanks very much. Um, bear with me while I get this screen shown. Okay. Hey, can you see that okay? Yeah, all good. Okay, great. Stuff. Okay, thanks very much. So, so first of all, I'd just like to say thanks for the opportunity to speak today and also um, to Emily as well um, and uh, the SOI for the opportunity to be interviewed for the report that, uh, that uh, Emily was speaking about before. Um, so I suppose today I just wanted to talk to you about the refusals of leave to land and how we consider the detention within that process um, at the Border Management Unit. So just a little bit about us, I suppose um, we've been in existence really since the end of a pilot project in 2015 and we're responsible for the frontline uh, immigration controls at Dublin Airport. Um, and just kind of as a very general thing, we, we handled in, before the pandemic, we handled in excess of 30 million passengers through the airport, which would equate to about 15 million arrivals. Um, so quite a significant number. Obviously in 2020, that would have dropped off by a huge amount with the pandemic, um, but it started to recover again. And we're up to about 4.3 million passengers through the airport, about 2.1 million arrivals. So, um, uh, you know, quite, quite a busy environment. And also we've taken on quite a lot of um, public health checks um, due to the pandemic, we were checking PLS, um, locator forms, uh, EU digital COVID sets, and we were also involved in the mandatory quarantine. So ju just uh, to kind of illustrate that, um, you know, refusal of leave to land, are, are, while a very important part, are quite a small part of our work as well. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we assess admissibility of persons to the state in accordance with the Immigration Acts, and there's Broadly speaking, two categories of passengers. You've got UK, Irish, EU, EA nationals who have an entitlement to enter, and you've got non-nationals who require permission um, from an immigration officer. Um, and they will grant permission to enter and attach conditions, or a person may be refused under one of the grounds in the 2004 Act. Um, so that's the 438L that Emily spoke about, um, include reasons such as not in possession of a valid document, maybe a fake passport, or that they're not here for the purpose stated. And again, as Emily alluded to, multiple re refusal reasons may apply. For example, a person who states they're coming for a holiday and has discovered they're in fact coming to work could have section 43B and K applied. That's not no valid work permit and not here for the purpose stated. So um, I'm just gonna very quickly give you some, uh, show you some statistics for 2021. This is from January to September. Uh, I should point out these are preliminary statistics. They've not been fully audited um, and I'm really using them for illustration purposes really. Um, but you can see we've had uh, approximately uh, just over 400 people refused entry in September and 66% uh, of them or 277 of them subsequently sought protection following the refusal. So um, you can see since the start of the year, we were running at approximately 50% of people who were refused entry subsequently sought protection. And that's increased as the year has gone on, also in line with the refusals have increased as long as passenger numbers have gone up in the airport. Um, yeah, so, uh, but again, to point out, like, uh, it, sounds, it looks like big numbers, but we're in the context of 2.1 million arrivals, it is it is um, a, a small, very small proportion of passengers who come through the airport that are refused entry. So I suppose next uh, point is what happens when a person's refused entry? And, and most practical terms, um, we make the decision in the Border Management Unit on whether a person's should be granted entry or not, and we hand over to the Garden National Im Immigration Bureau who are responsible for the detention and removal of a person. And again, as I said, we're only in, uh, in operation in Dublin Airport and the other ports, it'd be um, uh, Gardaí who'd be responsible for the whole process, including the decision and the removal. So after a person's refused entry, they may be detained. Um, 
and pending their removal from the state. And that detention may be at port for up to 12 hours at a guard station or in a prison. And again, as Emily said, it's usually Cloverhill for males, Adolphus for females. Um, I suppose the Department of Justice uh, regards detention in such cases as necessary and appropriate in certain circumstances in order to ensure the removal of a person who has refused entry from the state. Um, and I suppose the next point is how would how detention is considered by the BMU and um, I suppose also tied to that is why we consider it if it's a responsibility of uh, GNIB for the detention and removal of why do we consider it. I suppose we're, we're, we're very aware that it's our decision that gives rise to the detention. So um, we will always look at alternatives to see if there is an alternative available to avoid the both the refusal and the detention if possible. Um, so the next part is on alternatives to refusal of entry as opposed to a uh, alternative to detention. Um, sometimes although a refusal and, and uh, the resulting detention may be a valid decision open to an immigration officer to make, um, we can look at alternatives. Um, I suppose we recognize that aside from the seriousness of detention, um, a refusal of leave to land can have consequences and, it, and impacts on the ability of a person to travel or obtain visas in the future. So um, a visa warning, for example, is used when a person who should have a visa arrives at the border without one. But weighing up all aspects of the case, the officer is happy that a fair and proportionate solution would be to grant entry rather than to refuse leave to land. Uh, and from January to September this year, we've issued 365 um, visa warnings. Uh, supervised departures are used when it's decided that a person can be granted entry, notwithstanding that a refusal reason likely could be applied. Um, so checks are made with the airlines to ensure that they've departed as they stated they would, and if they're not, if they haven't, um, the case will be referred to the repatriation division within ISD or Immigration Service Delivery to to pursue their removal. Um, so. It's again January to September this year, we issued 109 uh, supervised departures. Um, another similar one that I haven't really outlined here because I don't have statistics on it, but it is used regularly in practice, um, is we would just issue what we would maybe could term restricted conditions. Um, they're similar to a supervised departure, although they're used in, in cases where it's regarded the person is likely to comply with conditions and they're not at risk of absconding. They're often used in cases where a person arrives to do something that they should have a specific permission in advance to do. For example, they require a work permit, but a genuine mistake on their behalf. They thought maybe a residence permit for another European country would allow them to do that. Um, so again, a refusal under 43B of the Immigration Act probably could be applied in the case. But uh, we may grant entry on visitor conditions and explain to the person that although you know, you're not allowed to do it, we're happy to grant you entry on visitor conditions. Um, yeah. So uh, again, it's an alternative to the refusal um, in recognising that it is a serious matter for the person concerned. So after a refusal is decided on, I suppose, first things um, we'd consider is when is the next flight? Um, if that flight's going to be um, significant time till the next flight, are there any alternative flights available? And also whether a section 14.1 would, would, uh, could be used. So the timing of next flight is looked at as a means of minimizing the length of uh, time a person would need to be detained for. Um, if another flight to a different airport in the country of departure is available, it is often open to GNIB in accordance with the 2003 Immigration Act to return the passenger there instead. Um, and we liaise and work closely with GNIB in these cases to ensure a person's detention is minimized in, 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 by using the alternative flights. Um, where there are no flights within a short period of time, for example, beyond 24 hours, we will consider issuing passenger a 14-1 notice um, as an alternative to detention. Um, and as Emily outlined in section 14.1 of the Immigration Act, um, it provides for a person to be directed to remain in a certain place or district, uh, report back in, in, in the case of a refusal of leave to land, they'd be directed to report back for a return flight and surrender their passport. 
Um, and when considering whether a 14-1 should be issued or not, um, the likelihood of the person absconding, the risk to public security and the maintenance of the integrity of the common travel area are some key considerations for um, an immigration officer. And also, I should say, a Section 14.1 notice will also be considered in cases if there's uh, compelling humanitarian or family reasons why it might warrant being granted. Okay, so I'm going to talk then a little bit about detention duration. And um, between January and September this year, there were have been uh, 1,598 refusals of leave to land, which is approximately 0.0. 0.07% uh, of all arriving passengers. Um, of those refused entry, 238 or just under 15% of them were detained. And I will outline the duration of detention in the next slide. Um, I should note though that these statistics broadly record those that were detained for more than 12 hours or overnight. So are lodged in guard stations or prisons. Um, those who were removed the same day and within 12 hours are not included in these statistics. But as you can see, a large majority of those um, are not detained beyond 12 hours. And even when you take those who entered the protection process out of the refusal statistics, um, only 39% of them were detained overnight or beyond 12 hours. Okay, so uh, the next graph shows the um, the duration of detention from of those refused of those who were detained between January and September this year. Um, so as you can see, sixty five percent are one day, sixteen percent two days, seven percent three days, six uh, percent four days, and one percent five days, with four percent being greater than five days. Um, Generally speaking, five days would be in excess of what we'd ever really hope to return someone for, but um, pandemic has brought some particular difficulties. Um, if a person becomes unwell, for example, while in detention, you couldn't, um, obviously, you know, you couldn't ask them to get on a flight or you couldn't try and put them on a flight back to a country. Um, the other receiving country may have requirements around PCR tests. Um, so that may have contributed to the 4% that were in detention for more than five days. Um, okay. And finally, I'd just like to talk about some of our internal safeguards in the process. So when a refusal of leave to land is being recommended by an officer, that's reviewed by the supervisor, who will then consult with the HEO or assistant principal to decide if detention is warranted. And that's the point you'll be looking at the flights and the 14-1 potentials. Um, God National Immigration Bureau after handover will have a final review of the, of the case and will consult with BMU if they felt an alternative to detention may be appropriate. And finally, we receive a daily list um, of those who are in detention, um, which will be reviewed at manager or assistant principal level to ensure that detention is still necessary in the cases. Again, this may be that the person has become unwell um, and it's, you know, it'll be reviewed to see whether the detention is still appropriate and necessary. Okay, so that's it for me. Thanks very much. I'll uh, hand back to Alan. Great, thanks so much, uh, Kevin. Actually, that was really fascinating sort of practical insight into what uh, goes on. Can I just ask the smallest quick question? Mm. Okay, if, if somebody has been returned and put on a flight, who pays mm. for that flight? Um, so there's a liability on the carrier to carry the person back to the state um, that they, oh, if they brought them here. If they, if they were being returned with a different airline, uh, the carrier who carried them into the state in the first right. instance is, is obliged to pay for it. Very good. Okay, listen, I'd, I'd love to ask more questions, but I'd better not, because uh, I don't want to take uh, more time. So, look, it's, it's a great pleasure now to, to welcome Fiona Finn from the Migrant and Refugee Rights Centre. And uh, I, I sort of said when I was introducing Kevin that we, we see uh, the Department of Justice as sort of partners in, in the EMN network. And likewise, uh, with Fiona's organisation, uh, these have been partners and people we sort of whose expertise we've been drawn on. And uh, can I also say it's, it's great to have people from the Department of Justice and from the NGO sector uh, talking uh, here. It's great to get folks together uh, to talk through uh, all of these issues. So uh, delighted you're here. Fiona, thanks so much, and I'm going to hand over the floor to you now. Okay, um, thank you, Alan. Um, and I'll be very quick. I've cut this back a bit because I know we're um, under some time pressure. Um, 
So thank you, for, thank you very much, Emma and ESRI, for inviting me here today to present. And I really welcome this um, excellent and very timely report examining detention alternatives to detention, and international protection and return procedures in Ireland. I think Ireland's border control measures, they have been under uh, the subject of some media attention over the last 18 months, and in particular over the period of lockdown. And that's stemming from a number of kind of quite high profile cases. So I think this report is really timely as it provides a very comprehensive overview of, of our immigration and detention procedures. And then it also highlights the gaps between um, our international human rights principles and our obligations and our current practice. Just very briefly, a little bit about NASC. NASC is the Irish word for link, and we work to link migrants and refugees with their rights and with the core community. We were established in 2000. We have a legal advocacy service that supports about 1,200 people annually. And then we have a number of integration and kind of um, social inclusion projects. And our interest in this area really um, came about in 2018 when we published um, our report, Immigration Detention and Border Control in Ireland. And I'd very much like to thank Emily for her work and her contribution to that um, report. Um, I think as stated previously, there's, um, a, there's a marked absence of research in this area when it's contrasted to other European countries. And I think um, Mark Kelly's seminal research in examining immigration detention in Ireland was published in 2005. And this research highlighted the fact that some of the fundamental rights and protections afforded to immigration detainees fell quite short of our international human rights standards. And NASC's own research in 2018 found that very little had changed in the intervening years. And for us, I think it's very disappointing and concerning to note that some of the same areas, including access to legal representation, access to legal remedies, and the fact that people are detained in prisons for immigration-related offences still remain today. But I think it must also be noted that unlike many other European countries, detention, and in particular detention for protection applicants, and those seeking asylum in Ireland is very much the exception and it's not the norm. And I think that needs to be recognized and um, um, acknowledged. We do think though it is very concerning to see the numbers of people refused permission to, to land in Ireland has been increasingly, has been steadily increasing over the last number of years. And we have seen a number of refusals as well for uh, leave to land for people who are coming from um, conflict zones. I think for NASC, when we're looking at kind of fundamental rights and protections, one of the issues that's of most concern to us and the other NGOs working in this area is the fact that despite commitments from the Department of Justice and Equality over a number of years, that the punitive nature of our treatment of immigration detainees, they're continually held in prisons and in guard stations, and we believe they're wholly unsuitable for immigration detainees. And I think, you know, as was mentioned earlier, that immigration detention cannot be punitive in nature. And I think by holding or by detaining um, an immigration det detainee in a guard station and in particular in a prison, for us, I think is it, it goes against that principle. And I think, again, the CPT have been very clear on this in a number of their reports to Ireland. And they have clearly stated here that by definition, prisons are not a suitable place to detain someone who's neither suspected or convicted of a criminal offence. Now, I know um, there are kind of moves underway to convert Block H in Cloverhill um, to, be as, uh, to, to be used specifically for people who've been refused permission to land, but that's still not operational um, because of COVID. So if we look at the gaps really between the principles, the legal principles and the practice, and I'd like to look at it over just four particular areas. So first of all, if we look at kind of the, um, the, the basic legal rights and protections that people who are detained or subject to detention um, are afforded or should be afforded. So the first one and the most critical one is access to legal representation. Now in the Irish legislative framework for protection applicants and those subject to a, a Dublin transfer decision, they have these rights enshrined under legislation in the International Protection Act. And I think these rights are further kind of proper fastened by the um, Receptions Conditions Directive. And again, the Receptions Condition Directive reiterates that detention should be a measure of last resort. But if we contrast that then to uh, the people who have been detained under the Immigration Acts of 2003 and 2004, 
there's no expressed or explicit right to legal representation under those acts. And I think this is hugely problematic for people who've been detained on foot of a refusal of permission to land. And the report also notes that um, GNIB and the Border Management Unit informed that if requested, legal representation can be facilitated, but they're not provided with a panel of legal representatives. Now, given the fundamental nature of the rights at stake and the personal loss of liberty, the fact that, a legal, that legal representation can be provided, I think for us is, is wholly inadequate. And our experience and the experience of other NGOs working in the sector is that we're usually the first point of contact by a family member who's possibly in another country, who's in a panic, <clears throat> looking for some support or some legal representation for their family member who has been detained. Now, if we look at the CPT standards, um, the Committee for the Prevention of Torture Standards, they have clear and set standards for immigration detention. And this is built upon legal principles originating from international human rights instruments, such as the European Convention of Human Rights, and the relevant UN treaties and the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. It, but this provides that in every instance of the deprivation of liberty, it should be covered by a proper individual detention order and all detainees should have the right of access to a lawyer. And this right includes the right to talk to a lawyer in private, as well as to have access to legal advice for issues related to residence, detention and de deportation. This doesn't happen in the Irish context for those who are detained on foot of uh, permission to land. I think critically, there's no independent appeals mechanism here through which a person who's refused permission to land can appeal a decision. And sometimes in our view and from our experience, sometimes these decisions appear to be arbitrary and subjective in nature. And as stated in the report, these decisions are made without clear guidelines. And I think that for us amplifies the need for um, the right of an independent right of appeal. And anybody that's been detained on foot of um, the 2002-2003 Acts, for them, the only um, remedy or the only legal remedy, the only way they can challenge a decision is through the High Court. And for us, that's neither an accessible nor an effective remedy. And if a person is then detained in a guard station, they are afforded legal protection as they do have the right to notify a solicitor of their detention. And this is also reflected in the prison rules. However, as a report highlights, the detainees are not presented with a list of solicitors. Access, so accessing this very basic right can be very, very, very challenging for somebody who's newly arrived in Ireland. And I think this for us points to very serious um, access to justice issues for immigration detainees. I think the deprivation of liberty by state actors is, is an extremely serious act and it's one that can have huge reper repercussions for a person. And I think this is an act that must only be taken as a measure of the last resort. And if it is taken, it must come with the adequate basic protections for persons who are detained. Now, if we look at access to, to medical assistance and access to healthcare, here again, we see a disparity between the rights to access healthcare between protection applicants and persons refuse permission to land and those under a deportation order. The, the right is only enshrined in legislation for protection applicants. But the prison rules in 2007 state that every individual detained should be examined by a doctor upon admission to a prison or have access to a similar level of healthcare, which exists outside prisons. The report also notes that if a person requests medical assistance, that it can be provided by paramedics on site. And if a person is placed in detention, the same medical um, assistance and healthcare um, are afforded to those who are detained. And then if we look at the third um, right, access to information and the right to be informed, I think again, as we've seen with all the rights outlined, the right of access to information and the right to be informed doesn't apply equally to all immigration detainees. There's no right enshrined in legislation again for those who refuse permission to land. And the report notes that in the 2020 CPD report on Ireland, they reiterated their concerns here, and again, and that they've had in previous concerns, stating that immigration detainees are not provided with information in a language they understand, and that leads to a heightened anxiety. So the right of access to uh, information, as we can see it, I think it seems to exist in practice, but um, the legislation underpinning it is very, very, very limited in its scope. And I think when we're looking at 
the like what actually really happens in practice to people. So when we're examining the gap in fundamental rights and protections for people who are detained, I think we can best illustrate that through the experiences of some of the people who have gone through this system. So we've had very recently, we've had the very high, the high profile case of the Colombian student, Miss Estefani Gonzalez. Now, Estefani was refused leave to land in Dublin airport in 2020. She was on a student visa. She sought advice from the Department of Foreign Affairs before departure and before entering Ireland, but she was refused permission to land on the grounds that she represented a real and immediate risk to the fundamental policy interests of the state. She denied she posed any risk, but she was committed to the Doka Centre and kept isolated for 12 days in self-isolation. It appears it was her sister that managed to contact a solicitor on her behalf, and following an application to the High Court, which was uncontested by the state, she was released within 48 hours and she received an apology from the Minister for Justice. Again, in 2017, we had Paloma Silva Carvalho, a 24-year-old Brazilian woman who was detained in Dublin airport when she was trying to enter the country for a visit. Um, she, the immigration officers believed that she was entering Ireland with the intention to work without a permission. And she was consequently refused permission to land. Now, she had been in Ireland in 2016 and she lived and worked for a family in Galway as an au pair. And she was returning to Ireland to visit this family. Now, Brazilians are not required to apply for a passport prior to entering the state for a visit, but she was refused permission to land and detained in Dublin airport. She was then transferred to Dokus Women's Centre in Mungchoy Prison. So she spent the night in Dokus Centre, but was subsequently granted leave to remain in the state for 10 days through a discretionary decision by the Minister for Justice following significant media attention. And then in 2015, we had another high profile case of Wali Ola Safa, a 21 year old Afghan national who was arrested following his discovery without identification papers on the side of a motorway in Nace. Safi, Mr. Safi was subsequently detained in Clover Hill Prison for violating the Immigration Act in 2004 and failing produce, to produce um, identification papers. Wali Ola Safa had just arrived in London, or just arrived in sorry, Ireland following a three month journey from Afghanistan. And the final leg of his journey was in a container truck traveling from Calais, France to Ireland. And his case, he stated that he came to Ireland having faced persecution and insecurity in his home country of Afghanistan. And after less than two weeks in Clover Hill Prison, he was violently assaulted during a riot by a prison gang. He was kept, kept ca held captive and his face was slashed and his arm was broken. He subsequently applied for asylum and he was released. And I think what these cases clearly illustrate that there is a gap between the fundamental rights of protection that should under human rights law be afforded to immigration detainees and what can happen in practice. And I think what we need to try and keep in mind is when a person is refused permission to land, they are for in all intents and purpose, a kind of a legal no, no man's land because they're deemed not to have arrived in the state. I think as can be seen from this very, very quick overview of the fundamental rights and protections afforded to immigration detainees, in Ireland, I think we fall short of our international human rights obligations, and it leads a potentially vulnerable group of people unprotected with very few protections and safeguards. And I think we do have to take action to ensure that Ireland's immigration related practices will finally meet and match its human rights obligations. And I think this is worth stating here. So Carl Coulter wrote in 2005 on the foot of uh, Mark Kelly's report that the rights accorded to certain categories of people held for immigration related reasons fall short of international human rights standards, um, which include the right to inform a third party of one's detention, to have access to a lawyer and a doctor, the right to appeal against the legality while in detention, the right to information about rights in a language that's understood for the, by the detainee. While these rights exist for detained asylum seekers and those held in remand, for immigration related offences, they do not exist for those refused permission to land and who are held pending their return or for those who are held pending deportation, who only have the formal right to appeal the legality of their detention. They do not have the right for information about their rights in a language they understand or access to legal advice. Our, then this report and our report in 2018 also questions the, um, the practical usefulness of the formal right to appeal. Okay, thank you.
Thanks so much, uh, Fiona. So uh, we've now come, we've hit the 3.30 uh, deadline, but I think it would be terribly unfortunate if we were to break up without ha having any sort of a, an, an exchange. Uh, so what I'm going to do is the following. Uh, unfortunately, I, I uh, booked myself up with back-to-back -back Zooms, so I'm going to uh, drop out at, at this point, uh, but I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Emma Quinn, as I think you all know, heads EMN Ireland, and Emma will chair uh, the discussion uh, for about maybe about 10 or 15 minutes just to make, make sure that we, we do have some uh, exchange. So apologies uh, for dropping out because uh, I, I really actually would love to have stayed for the Q&A, uh, but I, on, on my behalf, can I just thank uh, all of our, our speakers uh, today. It's, it's been a really, really enjoyable event. I said, hate to leave it, but uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Emma. So over to you, Emma. Thanks, Alan, and uh, thanks for chairing up to this point. I know I was having a few issues with my microphone earlier, so please let me know if there's any problem with hearing me. Everyone's nodding, that's good. Okay, so we have a few uh, questions in the uh, Q&A box and I'd encourage you to, to pop more in, um, just so that we take this opportunity to really um, to get the benefit of these great presentations and, and the speakers gathered here today. Um, I think, a, are, are we still, uh, I think maybe we're still on Fiona's, feed or is that uh maybe that's just mine okay not to worry all right so um we have two related questions that uh, relate to to people who are found on the territory in an irregular uh, migration situation and one a uh, person would like to know are such people detained and another person would like to know um if there are figures or data uh, behind um, the apprehensions of individuals found on the territory uh, who don't have immigration permission. So I think probably I'll direct those to, um, to our Department of Justice representatives. And I should actually say, um, our, our colleague Angus Casey has, has joined the panel this morning, or this afternoon rather, um, who's going to be able to, to look after aspects that, uh, you know, that might go beyond the, the specific agreement of the Border Management Unit. So, so thanks for that. Would one of you like to, to address those questions, please? Yeah, um, sorry, Angus here. I, I think if the question is in relation to saying if somebody is apprehended, presumably by Angarda Giacona, as opposed to uh, if that's my understanding of the question, I suppose the question is it depends on if they're apprehended, you know, the, the nature of their status in the state at the time is the key point. If they um, I can't speak to operational considerations by the guards, obviously, but it would depend on whether or not there's an existing deportation order or something in place for the individual. So if somebody's found with no, um, you know, with no papers or something like that, and they were, you know, there was a check performed and they had a deportation order that might have um, implications for whether or not they, you know, their detention. Um, but in terms of their their status, if they're found with their papers and things like that, there is a formal process that somebody has to go through. I mean, the removal of somebody from the state is covered under the, um, the Section 3 of the Immigration Act 1999 in terms of the, you know, the, there is a process that has to be gone through before a deportation order would be signed in relation to them. So okay. I hope that clarifies it. I, I, I believe so. And just on the data, I mean, I, I can add, I suppose, that uh, data are collected by Eurostat on, on persons uh, apprehended um, uh, on the territory. And uh, perhaps that, that answers that particular question. Would any of the other speakers like to contribute on those points? If not, um, we can we can move on. Um, we had a question in relation to um, the nationality criteria that Sarah mentioned and whether or not states uh, in the EMN wine study, if any of them take account of statelessness in that context, Sarah. Uh, yes, thank you a lot for the question. Um, I'm afraid to say that I, for this, like, I'll need to go really back to the details and I would, um, uh, I guess that, so, you know, we didn't, the, the study didn't ask the specific question, so it didn't necessarily emerge, uh, although typically this isn't taken into account uh, within vulnerabilities factor in individual assessment. Um, plus in several cases, it may depends, in several cases, for instance, the return procedures, for stateless, really the return decision itself cannot be issued. So the issue of detention also doesn't take place because like one of the guarantee also provided is that detention in return procedures can only take place when there is a reasonable uh, perspective to return the person. 
Um, but again, I'm basing that like a more of a general knowledge and information. In the study, doesn't emerge uh, expressly, mm -hmm. although this is something that any of you may find also like in the in individual national contribution. As uh, Ireland worked on their national contribution, each member state did the same, giving a lot out of a lot more details about their procedures and, and legislations in place. Thanks. Um, yes, that's true. And it's probably worth uh, pointing uh, to that fact that there are national templates available on the central EMN website um, for each of the, the countries that contribute to the EMN synthesis report. We, we publish an Irish report within the ESRI research series, but uh, in other countries, the, the, the original template is, is published, but there, there should be something for every country there if you want to do a deeper dive into these, uh, into these issues. So we have another person who thanks all the speakers for incredibly informative presentations. I will just read the question. Um, it's for Emily um, and uh, it's, it's long, so I'll just read it to make sure I get it right. You mentioned that reporting surrender of passports and requirement to reside in a specific place are outlined in legislation as alternatives to detention. Are there any examples of community-based care management alternatives also included in legislation or currently ongoing in Ireland? And that's from Hannah Cooper from the International Detention Coalition. Um, so in terms of community-based case management alternatives, those don't exist in legislation and they're not ongoing in practice in Ireland. Um, so those, yeah, they don't exist. But what you do see are some of these care alternatives for children. So children are not detained but it's not permitted to detain children uh, under any part of any immigration legislation or international protection legislation. Um, so where children say, for instance, present at the border and um, you know, they're unaccompanied, then TUSLA is contacted. Um, so there's no detention of children and then they're placed uh, in the care of TUSLA. And then if a parent is to be detained, um, the child can also be placed in the care of TUSLA or sometimes one parent may be detained and the family is, uh, the rest of the family is subject to an alternative. Um, I'm just gonna go quickly back to persons who are irregularly in the state. I know we got a comment in there from GNIB. Um, so there's kind of two different situations. So a person can be irregularly in the state for less than 90 days, so less than three months, um, and they would fall within the legislation for refusals of leave to land. So, what would, be, what, tip, would typically happen, and this is what GNIB uh, told us in interviews, is that that person would be issued with a Section 14.1 notice, and then subsequently they can be issued with a Section 3 notice and removed uh, from the state. Um, and then persons who are in the state for longer uh, can also then be uh, issued with a deportation order on the grounds that they do not have permission to reside in the state. So that's the different legislation. It often depends on on whether the person, uh, how long they've been in the state, but in the main, a person is not automatically detained if they've received um, a deportation order. Thank you. Thanks, Emily, for that additional information. I didn't see that comment. Um, so a short practical question for Kevin, where detention is not a, a consideration, is a decision to refuse leave to land escalated uh, beyond the supervisor? Yes, um, in, uh, in fact, this year, um, Border Management Unit brought on a number of um, immigration managers at higher executive officer level um, to cover um, almost 24 hours, but any, any time there's flights, there'll be a manager present um, and available to escalate uh, such decisions. So, yeah, yes, is to, even, even in cases without detention, yes, still the manager input into that. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so uh, an update is requested on the detention centre at Dublin Airport. I wonder if you could uh, give us a bit more information or perhaps Angus. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, I can't add too much in relation to that. Like the, the, the centre at Dublin Airport is uh, um, it was within the purvey of the um, Garda Sheikon and GNIB, so I can't really speak in any great detail in relation to that. My understanding is that, that progress in relation to that centre is ongoing. Okay, thank you, Angus. Um, I think finally then for, for this afternoon, um, we have a question um, in relation to access to, to a lawyer. Um, can Kevin or Angus tell us how communication can be facilitated between a lawyer and someone in detention? Usually uh, this, this person is, is, is saying, usually they're told that for data protection reasons, they cannot speak to a third party unless they have written instructions from the individual concerned. Isn't this a catch-22 for persons in detention? 
Um, I, well, it, all I would say is that I mean, as bizarre position really would be is that the GNIB and um, uh, BMU have kind of stated in the report that where somebody is seeking to speak to a legal, um, you know, legal representative when they're like in that airside location, they will be facilitated. So I don't know if there's specific instances that are being referred to by the questioner or not, but I mean, um, it would always be the uh, the view or the aim of BMU or GNIB to facilitate facilitate that where possible. So I'm not sure if there's specific instances where that may have happened. Um, I don't know if there's further comment in relation to that, but our, like our position would be that where somebody is seeking to make contact with a legal representative, that that would be facilitated. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, Angus. Uh, I think unless anyone has any uh, last minute uh, questions, we can uh, thank again and release our, our speakers. Um, uh, just to remind you that the report is available on the EMN website, also on the ESRI website, and we will put a video recording of this uh, of this event um, uh, on, on the on the ESRI YouTube uh, channel shortly. So I would really like to sincerely thank you all for for your inputs. It's been a really informative and interesting uh, session, and uh, all the best. Thanks again.